Let's see, live YouTube Monday with treats for Marcus. Um, we're gonna do six treats today because today is a summary of the six roles. The six roles, the three drama roles, the three empowerment roles, victim, rescuer, persecutor, creator, coach, challenger. Today, we are gonna put it all together and you're gonna get to watch Marcus eat six treats. And we have a special guest star today, <gasps> Betty White. You will be hearing more about her later because she is part of the alchemical process that makes these six roles work together. Paisley is here, who else is here? This is Dr. Renee Ostertag, chooming in from Denver, Colorado. Here's Marcus Barkus Aurelius. He's chooming in for one of these six treats. Marcus, come on up. I'm Renee. My name is Renee. This is Marcus Barkus. Oh, look at that good boy. He's very excited. So Marcus, while well, he gets six treats, can you hear me and see me okay? It looks like it. Moana, Oana, KP, Paisley, everybody, it's so good to see you. Who are you and where are you chooming in from? How's the weather where you are? We have been rainy and gloomy. That's really unusual for Denver because we have more sunshine every day in a year than Florida. I think we have over 300 days of sunshine and it's been rainy and wet and a little cold. I don't mind because it makes the world really green. And I wanted to share a little miraculous Marcus moment. Marcus, come on up again. We're still working on this trick. <gasps> there it is, good. He just got groomed. So he got a haircut. I like him a little bit longer, but you know, the answer to a short haircut is two weeks. So when he got groomed, he got a lot of energy back because he was feeling cooler. And this morning he was running around Cheeseman Park like a mad dog. It was so fun to watch. His behavior was being fueled by this high, high, high energy because of two factors that changed his haircut and the weather. And it made me think about how these external factors can influence our behavior, right? And it can be external as close to you as your own hair. It can be external as far away as the weather. But really this invitation and reminder, if your behavior is changing, it could be because of some external factor that's influencing your internal physiology. And you may or may not even be aware of it. So give yourself some grace while I give myself grace, recognizing I'm not using the right microphone today. Is my audio coming across okay? I normally have like a fancy microphone and today I don't. So Lomija, you had 23 degrees in Finland. Sunny, windy, and chilly in North Wales. Great audio. Thank you, Julie Marie. Oh my God, it's so great. Marcus was excited about it. Trying to see this other trick he can do. Marcus, sit. Where are you chewing in from? Leave it. And that's the thing. These external environments change our behavior and we can learn to change and shape our behavior in response. Take it. A dog would normally just take the food but I've been able with him to train his nervous system to shape new behaviors. All kinds of possibilities in the world. Jody Mitchell, it is a true delight to see you here from Vancouver, Canada. And Julie Marie, Scottsdale, Arizona, you're a traveler with your work. What is your work, my friend? What brings you here today? My name is Dr. Renee Ostertag. I have a clinical doctorate degree in physical therapy. I've been doing it over 23 years. I became a psychotherapist because it turns out mind and body don't want to live in disconnect. And I needed to learn more about how the mind works. 
all of that makes me a nervous system ninja. And I'm far more comfortable than I used to be in the three U's of life. The unknown, the unexpected, the unwanted. I love truly training people and giving them skills to become a nervous system ninja themselves. And that is why we are here, my friends. That is why we are in this conversation. Random question for you all. Scott, Dr. Renee, hello. Hello. Hi, hi, hi. It is just such a delight to see these return people in this gathering building community. It's really, really lovely. Nicole is here. Hi, friend. Um, Scott's in Santa Fe. What a gorgeous place. Julie Marie, you're a nurse. I thought that might be the case. 13-week travel assignments are frequent. I have several friends that do that. Brian, you're excited to hear her story today. Okay, so I'm so excited. King of Prussia, Nicole, good to see you. Um, my inner persecutor voice just persecuted me for being a public speaker and saying, um. <laughs> these freaking rules that we get from these outside authority sources throughout our lives. They plug themselves in like viruses to our program. I'm pretty sure nobody here is mad at me for saying um on a YouTube live. So Mr. Persecutor, thank you for trying to be good, right? And follow the rules. Today is educational in nature. It is not intended to be medical advice. So please adhere to my disclaimer. If you are indeed feeling troubled or concerned about any health care symptoms you're having, please seek some professional support. I can be that professional support for you if you like. I'm a physical therapist and you can schedule a free consult with me under that licensure degree. I just want to say a total side note. Please, if you're going to seek external support in your health care, Bring your instinct along with you and listen to that inner voice of knowing. There's a lot of freaking garbage out there and people will tell you things. And because you're in a scared place, you'll listen to anything desperate to get out of your pain. Please pump the brakes and listen to your own inner knowing before blindly following the advice, the diagnosis the medication prescriptions, the surgical instructions, like listen to your knowing because it will guide you well. That's a process to learn how to do that. Had no intention of saying that, but there you go. Sometimes these things flow on through. So Mr. Marcus, our teacher for the day, behaviors can be driven by external influences. As you saw my persecutor, and behaviors can be adapted, changed, modified, redirected, and learned from the inside out. And the last six weeks, we went over six common roles. By the way, that's what I wanted to ask you. How confident are you? One to 10. There's no good or bad or right or wrong here. This is a curiosity question from me to you when it comes to the healthcare system and external authority figures in not contrast, but standing on the same space, your own voice of like what you need to do and what's right for you. How confident are you in that voice? One to 10. One is not confident at all. 10 is would die if it told me to. So confident. I'm really genuinely curious. How much do you trust in your own inner voice of knowing that can guide you through health challenges and well-being? Those are two different states. So, oh yes, Nicole's coming in at a solid 10. I just saw you land like a gymnast at the Olympics. Brian's a seven. Nicely done. No right or wrong here, folks. It's a question, a curiosity, and valuable. So Lamia is coming in at a nine. That's great. And the reason why I ask this, it's a good thing for you to know and maybe build the people in my life professionally that I've seen with greater struggles and suffers have lower numbers. 
in their trust and confidence of that internal guidance system. That's funny, four, two, six, 10. So your handle is four, two, six, coming in with a gymnast stick landing at a 10. Okay, friends, we're gonna do a little recap today. And as we go into this recap, I invite you to hold an image of a, of a, a tire, a circle, a wheel on a bicycle. There's a hub and there's a circle and all these little spokes. So just hold that in your mind on the stage of your life. We're gonna review these six roles and then talk about how to integrate them. And today I really would love to encourage a back and forth dialogue. It's not like I have all the answers. I have some answers that have worked well for me in my own personal journey and seen work well in observing people personally and professionally. I would love to hear from you as we go through, how have you, if at all, integrated these six roles to unify them or to change their order as to how they show up in your life? So I already got some gorgeous feedback from a few people and I'll be bringing that to light as well. All of this started for me in Chicago recently. I went to some improv and did some improv classes at Second City in Chicago. And I was amazed at the stage and there was six empty chairs on it. And then six players came out and created magic through these roles of improv. And I thought about these three roles on the drama triangle side, victim, rescuer, persecutor. And I thought about how I've only really, especially in the trouble areas of my life, been using three of my six players on the stage of my life. And so my victim rescuer persecutor were the dominant actors in my life, especially when it came to my professional world as a healthcare provider that got overcoupled with a rescuer. And also in romantic partnership, which is stemmed a lot from, you know, childhood trauma, family dynamics. And I thought to myself, why am I only using these three players? And I have six, creator, coach, challenger. What would it be like for all six to have a different ratio of their stage time? And so that's what we've been exploring the last six weeks. Victim, rescuer, persecutor, creator, coach, challenger, and how they show up in our body, which affects our mind and how we show up in our lives. To recap, I'll do a little charades improv here. Victim. <laughs> okay, so when I go victim, my trunk collapses. I close down and disconnect visually and, and I look down. And the thinking and feeling and behaving that goes along with that body posture is I can't. I am helpless, I'm powerless, I have no agency. And I'm always reacting to life and thinking life is happening to me. I need to keep people at a distance. I need to stay separate. And there's no energy for like any of the eight C's being creative, curious, compassionate, calm, because it's all wired towards life threat because the victim thinks I'm going to die because it's rooted to past neurological experiences that were overwhelming and scary. That's how victim shows up for me. I would be delighted to hear from you. What have you learned about how victim shows up for you? in your body, in your mind. And I really encourage sharing here, type it in the chat live or later, it will help you learn it. And this is a game changer for you to take back a sense of control in your life so that these subconscious programs 
installed in your central processing unit operating system of the human system that you are, they can like, you know, step back from being the lead actor, actress in your life. And then it creates some space for the other role to come in like creator. And when I think about creator, in my body, that's the first thing that happens. And you, the creator isn't quite as dramatic when you look at my body, but I can tell you, I feel spacious and calm. My eyes want to look around the world. My neck is very free and mobile to wonder about the world and all that's in it. And so I will know that I have creator energy in my life when my physiology is more calm, spacious, curious, a flexible neck that isn't locked up and rigid. I'm curious, how do you know when your creator is running in your body, your mind, right? The creator feels, according to this lovely powerofted.com, hopeful, energized, inspired, and resilient. I would add like free and spacious. The thoughts, I do have a choice despite my circumstances and I am dedicated to continued growth and I am focused on what I want to create. Hmm. Kind of makes me want to drool a little bit. All right, friends, victim, creator, how do they show up in your body, right? Mm, victim. <sighs> creator, did you see what I just did there? That's a little body bridge. Oftentimes the victim is so painful that it's shut off and disconnected from a feeling of the creator in my body. Ah. <sighs> Julie Marie, lovely nurse. Thank you for the work you're doing in the world. It's this, you know, healthcare, it's a real, in my experience, like sinkhole trap of victim, rescuer, persecutor energy. Um, so Nicole says her victim is pain. Oh my God. You know, I could say a lot about that, Nicole, but in short, pain is perception of threat rooted in fear. Julie Marie, the victim role has me slouched and tense. Yeah. And that's not to say that all slouching intention is victim, right? We're a hundred billion neurons with a hundred trillion connections. There's infinite possibilities here. We're developing more pattern recognition. So that way you can develop more agency in how you want to show up with your patterns and start laying down tracks to have more powerful patterns available to you. Just like with Marcus earlier, he had a powerful pattern of being able to wait to eat his treat because I told him to wait and then he can take it when I tell him to take it. That's a pattern that we've developed in him. Victim. You know, one time I was doing a talk and I told a group of healthcare providers, the APTA in Nebraska, the, the entire chapter of Nebraska's professional meeting, I told them to stop being a, a, a rectum. <laughs> and what I had done is I combined the words victim and rescuer. And when you are in a rush at the end of your talk and you're stressed on time and your name's Renee, you will tell a group of 100 professionals not to be a, a rectum because a rescuer and a victim, when you put them together, will create a rectum in your life. So that was an embarrassing, fun story. Don't fall into your rectum. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, beautiful Brian, the victim makes me literally feel physically weak. Wow, 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 wow. This is such an insightful, spacious place, my friends. When you share, you learn, and you learn about you, and you learn that you're not alone. Victim gets a bad rap. 
it's an indicator of an injury or harm that has occurred in your past and the injury didn't heal properly and it needs support and compassion. So you're not alone. We've all been injured. And by talking about it, we can bring it to light more. So let us evacuate our rectums and uh, head on over to the rescuer and the coach dynamic. If you have any thoughts, insights, or ahas as we go here, please feel free to share. The rescuer. How does the rescuer live in my body? It's like I'm in this like frozen panic terror, but it's like a very functional freeze. My energy is very high. I'm very tense in my neck and shoulders. I'm sort of frozen deep in my like vocal cords. And so then I have to really push with all the extraneous neck muscles to get my voice out. And I'll get really tired and fatigued. And there's just a very high arousal, high sympathetic drive. And then after I crash, so it's very much the boom of my boom bust cycle. So I know that when my neck is really tense and stiff and rigid, I'm probably running rescuer energy. When I feel panic or out of control, that's a really good indicator that my rescuer is running. And there's nothing wrong or bad or shame, shaming, shameful about this. This is a character in all of our lives that we all play. And again, just like the weather's making Marcus's behavior crazy in my biased experience as a healthcare provider in this present day system, that external environment will oftentimes evoke my rescuer energy. Um, there's a lot more to be said about that, but people can oftentimes come in with this helpless, powerless feeling. And th that victim energy will trigger my own uh, rescuer energy. <laughs> oh, Juana, I love your comments right now. The rescuer feels a bit like scrat. <laughs> from the ice age where the acorn is anybody prone to being rescued. I haven't even seen that movie, but I can totally see the image. And I think I know the cartoon that you're talking about. And that's actually a really good uh, little mm, glimmer of what's to come. This series has inspired me. I'm going to be creating a little small group class. I'm going to cap it at 12 people starting in June on the 7th. We'll do three weeks and then you can opt in for a second three weeks. So it'll be um, weekly. And one of the activities we're going to do is find a visual representation of every character in your theater. So it's going to be fun. Um, Yes, and lighten all of this up because we all have all six. And Oana knows her victim makes her feel frozen and tense. Everybody's going to have a different physiological expression. And the creator feels expansive and playful. Oh my gosh, I'm so excited to have you all meet Miss Playful Betty White here. <laughs> right. Jody likes the acorn. When we can put an image to these roles and connect it to our body and talk about it in a group. My friends, magic happens. I've seen it with a few of you in our personal dialogues. I've seen it with some other um, colleagues and patients and students that I've been talking about this with. I'm so excited. This is really a shift from drama to power and it helps us get out of pain and all of the pain that the drama can bring about to us. So there's the rescuer. We know it. We feel it. The thoughts, the behaviors, the feelings of the rescuer. I must save you from harm. Here's my coat. Come along. I can make everything in your life better. Yesterday, talk about drama and the expectations and the pressure. And it just sets up everyone to fail. And yet, when I think about myself in that role, I never knew I was doing it. I just kept getting burnt out and thought maybe changing my career will help or maybe learning something new will help or changing jobs will help. Like, okay, 
external conditions can help internal mechanisms short term, but they can't create long term internal change. You can change external conditions, but internal mechanisms that drive our experience need to be changed if we want different results. So the rescuer, right? Um, Julie Marie, I love that we're in this healthcare world together. And I know there's a few others of you here that are in that world. So feel free to chew on in. Julie Marie, that feeling in the neck with the rescuer, the experience of living in that mode at work is most likely where I'm coming from. Yeah, I think just like the cooler weather drove Marcus's crazy behavior, I think, this is my biased perspective, that the default mode of the healthcare atmosphere or environment or weather will drive victim, rescuer, persecutor behavior in us and perpetuate the dis-ease. Let me say that again. That environment that's meant to help us heal is actually perpetuating our problems through no fault of its own. It's just what is happening as I see the world. And I love that you're um, in love with improv, my friend. Do, 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 do. She keeps wanting to make a scene. Come on board. You're almost, it's almost your time. Oh my God. Okay, the rescuer. If I do good, I'll be worthy. Maybe you'll finally like me. All of my people pleasing behaviors come from the rescuer. All of my hyper achieving that drives me into the ground and exhausted come from my rescuer. And then I feel sorry for these other people. I feel sorry for how bad their life, like I'm literally kind of feeling a, an energy of like disgust. And I don't know what I'm disgusted at, like the dynamic that this environment's supposed to help us feel better and it's all keeping us trapped and stuck and feeling sick, Ugh. right? I think on some level, my body is maybe, who knows, I'm making all this up, but like, ugh, can I barf out this role because it's not congruent with my authentic expression of who and how I want to be in the world? I think all of us are actually meant naturally and organically to have creator, coach, challenger be the main stage actors and the victim, rescuer, persecutor. They might be lead, uh, supporting actors or occasional guests and visitors, but not the lead show, not the lead actors. The feelings of the rescuer, I fear you don't need me, right? Like I fear not being needed. I feel persecuted uh, when the victim doesn't accept my help. Heaven forbid they actually empower themselves and do it for themselves. And then I don't feel needed so that I'm left with my own worthlessness again. Ugh, again, that's not my authentic expression, but it's a program that got so deeply wired in from past injury, friends, emotional injury psychological, mental, social, physical injuries, if they don't heal, will limp around and, and then things go off kilter and it shows up in the form of these social roles and how they live in the body. Nicole feels like her rescuer gets lots of exercise with all the animals. Like, are you really in danger or distress or is there some sort of wolf cry going on? Hmm. It sounds like there's some vigilant energy associated with your rescuer, Nicole. Scott is dealing with, should I intervene with a relative's issue in your area or do I let them have the experience and deal with it on their own? That's a good one, Scott. And we talked about that when we were talking about the rescuer to coach. Um, a rescuer will just come in and save the day with their hero's cape. I didn't even plan to wear this. And it's funny that it's red, right? Like, you know, S Swiss army rescuer, first cross. Um, 
the rescuer is like, I'll just assume you need my help. You can't do it for yourself. I'll offer all sorts of unsolicited advice as opposed to the coach. Hmm. Let's get curious and ask some questions here to them, to myself. All right. So the final behavior of the rescuers, I jump in and save the day. It fosters this sense of dis, um, dependency and indispensability, which if you're a healthcare environment that makes money from that, that's amazing. Um, whoa, this one right? The rescuer will sacrifice the truth to protect others. The truth is a gift that not everybody wants to hear. And because the rescuer can't necessarily tolerate the discomfort of truth and its effect on another, because I'm dependent on them to be well so that I can be well. So if they're not okay, because they're uncomfortable with the truth, then I'm not okay. So it's a codependent thing. And then we won't tell the truth really ultimately to protect them, but it's about ourselves. And so we shield others from the consequences of their own actions, right? Because the more we perpetuate these victim, rescuer, persecutor behaviors, the more we get of that. And that again is not a character flaw or fault or something that you're choosing an injury got plugged into your system and it's expressing yourself it is a desperate cry of attention signaling unmet tragic need tragic unmet need please support me so when you see rescuer in you or another when you see victim in you or another find your breath and some compassion and scott when I think about the coach, again, it's not as physically visible for me. And I'm wondering how coach shows up for all of you. The, the rescuers, very high energy, kind of panicky, scattery, like one of those, you know, those um, little blow up doll things that try to get your attention. Hey, look at this store. Like that's kind of the rescuer in my body, but the coach, like, Again, you might not see as much. There's more space. I have eye contact. I'm present to my own experience. My digestive system relaxes. I literally just burped, and that's usually an indicator of down regulation for me. And there's like, again, that kind of wonder, like, huh. My eyes want to look around and be curious. And when I'm dialed in and connected, I can ask questions like, do you need support? What's going on for you? Right? So it sounds like, Scott, you're sort of halfway between this rescuer coach because they're spectrum. What side of the spectrum do I want to be coming from? I'll tell you by perspective, the more calm you are in your body, the more you're coming from those three C's. The coach is chill, observant, and relaxed in the call. Yeah. And that's something we need, I, in my opinion, oftentimes to train ourselves to do because our past experiences and present environments may not be fostering chill, observant, and relaxed. So the coach has thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. People are resourceful and creative. You're welcome, Scott. I believe that you are resourceful and creative. I believe you have the ability to find a calm body. And I believe clarity will come to you as you do that. Because I trust others and their ability. That's what the coach thinks. I trust. Now, I may not trust all people, but I trust in their capacities and in the indwelling three C's creator coach challenger. I do trust that that lives in everyone. And the more I occupy that space, the more I can energetically mirror neuron, pull it out of others or invite it. All right. I don't need to pull anything out of anybody else. Things naturally emerge. The feelings of the coach is compassionate and engaged. They feel fulfilled and reflective, supportive 
and non-attached, right? I'm going to support you, which I really am in this great place with all my patients, but I don't care what you do or don't. I just love you no matter what. You have that role in my life. It's a professional type of human godlike love. And I'm here to support you. And that's my role. I am not attached to what you do or don't. And that in and of itself is a healing form of energy, right? Like your attachment isn't threatened with me. Go do and find your authentic self and your authentic expression. How does coach live in you, Scott? Anybody else? We got a lovely crew here today. We're going to talk for a minute about this inner coach. Yes, solo mija. I just like saying your name. Vino Gradova. This recap of these four roles so far, there's six. I'm, I'm tempted to share a story of somebody that I know, and I would like to keep that person's privacy private. Um, because that's important. This person maybe has a lot of history with anxiety, um, anger, and depression, and spent a good majority of their life. And we had been working together for several months, and this person's inner like peace and calm is significant. Like they're starting to feel more spaciousness in this like white space, ground zero experience inside themselves, which is really lovely because the anger, anxiety, and depression were sort of lifting and there was more space between their authentic self and those energies. And then this person went into a store one day and my recollection of the event is it's like everything's bad, nothing is good. If it can go wrong, it will, and it did right? It's later than this person wants it to be. It's darker than this person wants it to be. It's more crowded than this person wants it to be. They're in line at the store to check out. The person in front of them has BO. It's like the worst, worst, worst. And the like peace and calm is gone. Like anger, rah, 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 like inner boiling pot of like what kind of energy. And then all of a sudden this person hears a voice and it says, you are responsible for how you feel. And when this person was telling me this story, he's like, Renee, I swear I thought the person behind me said it. And I turned to look and nobody was there because it was that real. And that story that that person went through when he told me that story, we had this lovely exchange about who was that? Because I have that same thing. And I decided to start calling it my bit, the benevolent inner therapist. And so we joked about how this benevolent inner therapist is kind of like this nice old lady, like Betty White. She's sharp. She's wise. She's clear. She's truth telling. I think of her oftentimes as like my inner coach, but she has a lot of self energy capital self energy. So that's why Betty's here. She'll make a little bit more of a scene uh, shortly. But as we move into this persecutor challenger, in that story, she kind of challenged that person's persecutor type energy, right? Very angry, aggressive. Rah, and and she challenged it and said, hey, you're responsible for how you feel. So I decided to get an actual bit to remind me when I'm disconnected from my own capital S self energy, when I'm disconnected from this bit who can play those three roles really well, coach, creator, challenger. She hangs out with me and during rough times and places, I keep her near me. And yesterday was a day. It was Mother's Day. I had lost my mom when I was very, I was 11. And there's a big void there. And she can fill this space. It's really nice. 
along with many other people. Happy Mother's Day to you, belated one day. I have many replacement mothers in my life for which I'm very, very grateful. And that right there was an example of me being more of a creator in that story as opposed to a victim in that story. Hmm, my friends, persecutor, I am right now, like, I go so tense and just vigilant and ready to pounce. My jaw, I get a lot of, uh, not anymore, I used to get a lot of clicking and pain and headaches. Eye strain, um, because that's, and again, kind of like neck tension, but for me, it's very much in my face, how the persecutor shows up and my voice goes really pushy because the victim will close down my vocal cords and then the persecutor overrides so that I can still be heard, damn it. And I like go really primal animal, like when Marcus um, gets a toy and like that, he like, like, that's what my persecutor wants to do. And it's this desperate attention of like, please help me. I'm suffering. I'm in pain. I have unmet need. Until you train that, I think really hard to get out of that. Friends, friends. Okay, let's move on through. The thoughts of a persecutor. How does the persecutor show up in your body, friends? The thoughts, I must win. Dominating others will get me ahead. It's a very lonely position. And I know best, right? You Whatever, your thoughts or opinions, I know I'm right, right? It's just the way that is. It's persecutor thinking. Um, so the feeling is very defensive and on guard, that vigilance. Um, I'm discounted on the inside because I don't feel seen, heard, valued, appreciated. So I have to lash out and very self-righteous. Like, I don't like how being wrong feels because I didn't, get permission to make mistakes. So I've got to be right. And um, that makes me self-righteous. How does the persecutor show up in your body? Oh, Jody, this is beautiful. Yep. The persecutor can sometimes become a prosecutor. And it is a spectrum. Jody had this gorgeous image last week. And I want to talk about it more here. About how the persecutor like a little baby challenger and it hasn't matured or developed or gotten the support that it needs. And so when I think about like a control panel, I can turn the volume up or down. And so the maturity level, and this is not a character flaw, it's biological, the maturity level or development level of the persecutor as it's supported, it can become the challenger. And so like the guy in the store, his inner bit um, cued him to do some calming exercises and settle down and remember, yeah, everything's fine. This isn't exactly how I wanted things to unfold, but it's going to be okay. And the challenger can support the persecutor and the persecutor is just this poor little kid that got asked to climb this big mountain that it wasn't equipped to climb. It was too little. It didn't have the right training skills, support, um, equipment. And so the challenger who's bigger and older and more mature further along in the dial, the challenger can say, Hey, here's my hand. You want to take it? Maybe put your foot here. Maybe put your foot here. And so we can activate this inner challenger coach creator to support the younger versions that have unmet need of victim rescuer persecutor. It's a gorgeous image where the more resourced parts of you can help the less resourced parts of you. And somewhere in that spectrum, I think was Jody's point, please clarify as needed, but the persecutor can become a prosecutor where the persecutor like blames people and shames people, but the prosecutor condemns them and will absolutely lock you up 
into this prison of pain. I think my inner persecutor was the form of a prosecutor when it was like, I really genuinely believe I'm like this shameful, disgusting pig shit of a human. Like the low, the self-loathing, the low esteem, the low value folks have been there. It's super like tight in my head as I talk about it. That's painful. And that's what can happen when these roles perpetuate in our system and don't get their needs met, don't get the support they deserve, and they can't evolve out of it. And I think on some level, every expression of dis-ease in mind or body is reflecting back to these inner social dynamics. And so how do we shift, right? The first piece is knowledge of the six roles, awareness of their thinking, feeling, and behaving, how they show up in your body, your mind, your dynamics. Let's finish up the challenger role, and then we'll talk about more how to create unity in these roles as they live within you. So final thought, the challenger, again, when I think about the persecutor, I already talked about how that shows up in my body. How does it show up in yours? Right now, I'm a challenger. And again, that's the theme. You don't see much in the creator coach challenger. They're calmer. They're more mature. They're less panicky and freaked out. They're more safety instead of threat. They're more love instead of fear. The challenger for me is very rooted and grounded and still. And my thoracic cage breathes beautifully. I can feel like my thoracic diaphragm expand. I'm connected to my seat and my feet. Like I'm very aware of where my pelvic bowl is. I feel like a statue on like a big frozen, uh, not not frozen. Like, you know, those statues that are standing on those big cement things. Like I have a foundation underneath me and that foundation is my pelvic bowl supporting the rest of my physical structure. It's like a good, strong foundation of a building. You got that locked in. The building can withstand all storms. If you got a crooked foundation, third floor window is going to be off and it's not going to be feeling very safe in there if a storm of life comes along. So challengers thinking is, Marcus is totally dreaming. I don't know if you could hear that, but he was just like, he says, hi. He says, wake up your challenger because it feels icky getting slime. Just, just like Nicole said. So the challenger believes that things unfold at their own pace, which does require trust. It's a big deal for many people. The challenger thinks you can do this. I don't need to do it for you. You're capable. You might need some support along the way. But the challenger, I think, has that trust in that foundation of their body and their own system to be able to trust the unfolding around themselves. The feelings of a challenger, self-awareness, they're empowered through living out their values. I'm very clear, my top three values, truth, connection, and health. And when my relationships aren't living in those, I get achy in this moment talking about it. So the challenger knows their values and they're confident, direct, and clear in communicating that. The behaviors, the challenger will provoke or evoke themselves and others to take action. Okay, this is, right, maybe new, requires some courage. Let me take some action. Let me support you to do the same. That's what the challenger is capable of doing. They're focused on improvement and growth. They hold themselves and others accountable. When you come to see me for neck pain or back pain or anxiety, I know you can heal this 
And our work together is to unveil those circuits within you to allow them to operate. That's how this works. So a needle pulling thread. How do you connect that note to follow? So my friends, I see this beautiful stage of the theater of my life. I get to know the characters, right? Like there was Acorn as the rescuer. I think of the movie Inside Out a lot. And I think of fear as my rescuer. And I think of um, disgust and anger. Like if they had a baby, that would be my persecutor. Um, Joy sometimes is a little bit of my rescuer too. But like they're, to have these images of each role. And then we've got Betty, the bit, the inner benevolent inner therapist. Now, Betty is pretty great because I think she helps us here. Part of how to integrate these roles is at least a significant degree mystery. The way our right brain works, it is an unpredictable process that is part mystery. And so I lean into this concept that Dick Schwartz has with self energy, capital S self energy in the internal family systems therapy model. And there's this image, my printer was acting funky. So I could, I'm not gonna show you I'm going to show you my very last minute drawing of this wheel. And um, there's the self energy in the middle, capital S self, maybe represented by that bit that you have that is calm and clear and whispers to you. Right. And it's a circle and it's a dial. Right. And when we're less mature in development, greater unmet need victim, rescuer, persecutors here at the start of the wheel. And then as we mature, it goes around and we can become more creator coach challenger. All six of these players, maybe that's just three, maybe it's six, maybe these two, those two, that one, that four, but they, they're like a dial and the self energy can turn the dial up or down in any given moment just like different players can come out on stage in any given moment. There's a a player in my life right now that evokes a lot of creator. And there's a player in my life right now that evokes a lot of rescuer. And it's fascinating to see how these two external people evoke different scenes in my physiology. And so the idea of the self energy is at the middle and it goes around the wheel and you can turn this hub This is feeling very existential to me, but it's in line with how the right brain works, less so the left brain, which is predictable, organized, logical, follows rules that are rational. The right brain's a lot less predictable and consistent. So that's why I pull in a lot of the imagination and the imagery to support the left brain as you find the control panel Right. Just like inside out, there's this control panel inside the little girl's body that drives how it shows up outside. And we can find the control panel and help turn the dial from unmet need to met need, victim, rescuer, persecutor, creator, coach, challenger. And these eight C characteristics help it go around. What are the eight C characteristics? Curious, confident, courageous, compassionate, clarity, connectedness, calmness, creativity. Those eight C's were created by Dick Schwartz. And I like that it's eight because that's infinity and it is connected to infinite possibility within you. And the more you can connect to a calm body, the more it'll evoke this voice either from like your inner gut knowing coming up or your outside, like where'd that come from in my right brain? It's funny. I always point to my right brain when I talk about my bit, but like it can 
it can support the growth. It can help us get the needs met. So that's a big, long summary and a quick, tight takeaway of what and how do you get integration of these roles. I think step one is awareness. Step two is skills. Step three is lots of practice. And this is challenging work. We weren't meant to do it alone, which is why I'm going to be holding a course, which I'm just really hopeful that we can learn more from another, from another, from one another. Da -da -da -da. June 7th, 14th, and 21st for the first three weeks. You can just take those three if you want to take the next three. You can opt in for a total of a six-week course. But I'm so excited because it's going to be very community, collaborative, with some improv and some education, and we can all learn together. So a needle-pulling thread. <laughs> I have these habits from, from speaking, and as I get more aware eternally. It's an infinity process of never ending. We're always learning. So tell me, what is your takeaway? How are you seeing yourself? How are you seeing your world with the knowledge, the stories of these eight roles? Nope, six roles, eight C's. <laughs> the eight C's can help bring you more into an integrated theater of six. Okay, I'm getting awkward. Can somebody give me a comment or something? Talk to me, friends. We're approaching our hour. I would love to hear from you. What is working for you to help integrate these six characters in the stage of your life? Um, while that's wrapping up, got some crickets, my friends, you're good. It just leaves me to fill in all the space. I had this, um, story I was thinking about sharing. I might, I might not, I don't know yet. Jody just came in. It's okay to make space, large or small, for change or progression. It can feel like you may or may not have control of this, but you do. That's gorgeous. I think that's, when I think about ways to integrate, ways to shift, for me, the imagery of each character having a personification is really helpful. I literally carry this or some version of it around so that I can kind of check my behaviors. Where am I coming from? Getting to know it in my body. Having the self energy and like literally having some representation of self energy that's external to me to cue and remind me that I have it within me. KP likes the visual. She's on a boat and it's balanced. Oh, I love that. A lot. I can totally see three on each side, but now I'm curious which side has which players. Ooh, that's good. Um, Julie Marie taking notes. Great info. Thank you. It's helpful to turn a mood around. Yeah. Julie Marie, I um, have been training resilient practitioner courses for years, and it's amazing. If you have any interest in having a conversation about a fellow healthcare in the U.S., uh, reach out to me, info at greentreemind.com. Um, but yeah, I'm learning a lot about in healthcare things we can do to turn a mood around because that struggle is very real. Nicole is seeing herself in different riles. I can't really read that. Maybe I need glasses. I do need glasses. I'm seeing myself in the different roles. I think that's what you meant to say. And that is new and different. Beautiful. I'm not totally sure where they all come together or who they are, but it's interesting nonetheless. Yeah. Join the class. 
June 7th. I'm excited for it. We'll learn more together. Um, the last thing in developing more awareness and sense of control and more calm creativity, right? These eight C's as you bring your creator coach challenger more on board in your life, you will experience this is biological objective truth as you experience these a creator coach challenger more you will have naturally more clarity compassion courage confidence curiosity creativity calmness connectedness it's like if i put my head down my butt goes up it's biology right when when you tip the boat the teeter-totter or whatever towards more creator coach challenger, the natural effect is less drama and all of its expressions in health problems, relationship problems. The last thing I want to say is this sounds lovely and easy in my experience. It's not. It's not. <laughs> like it is not easy and everybody needs a nap. Okay, so what's a nap? A neurological adjustment period. When I first thought about playing the role of challenger, I had like panic attack chemistry. And it took me a long time to build and expand and stretch my chemical window of tolerance for the role of challenger because it was so uncomfortable for me. And so I just want to calibrate your expectations, expanding these roles and getting them embodied can be a chemically uncomfortable thing. And so give yourself that nap, that neurological adjustment period, give yourself a lot of grace and space to calibrate. And please friends, don't do it alone. Things as I'm seeing in the last five years of training other healthcare providers work better when we work together. If you want to go fast, go alone. But if you want to go far, have a team. And I'm really looking forward to creating a team of six people, 12 people together where we can find and expand our livingness in these roles together. So Thank you everybody for your time today. I'm going to wrap up here. I appreciate each and every one of you. Please take a moment to reflect. What's the one thing you're going to do to remember or take action with this dialogue, with these six roles, this seventh session today is wrapping up the series. I'd love to hear now or later, what is the one thing you want to remember? What's the one action you want to take? If you write it in the comments live or later, it will help you learn it deeper. Okay, friends, Margaret, nice to see you. Thank you for being here today. Next week is a very exciting week because I will actually have a real live guest we have Marcus Barkus every week. Today we had Betty, but next week it's going to be a real life human named Amelia Norfleet Dorn. And she's an amazing human. I really appreciate her and the work that she does in the world. She trains women's and families self, um, self-defense empowerment classes. And we're going to have a super fun conversation about how to learn how to drive your body like a car, high gears, low gears, and the terrain of life. And how do you navigate all of those things? So I'm really excited and would love to see you tuned in again next week. Thank you all so much for this time. It has been remarkably healing and I wish you all the blessings, all the self energy and support that you need. May we all receive it. May we all, may we all be well and ninja stay, right? The nervous system, uh, ninja in me sees and honors the nervous system ninja in you. Take care friends. We'll see you later.